Hey, welcome back. Let's talk about computer science. What is computer science and what is a programming language? Here we go. Computer science. Computer science is a study of three topics, computation, information, and automations. When we talk about computations, we're really trying to think about how can a computer solve arithmetic and non-arithmetic problems. When we think of information, we really talk about and think about how can we represent real world data digitally and effectively. And lastly, automation is about how do we design instructions so that a computer can complete that task. Um, so these three are the fundamental pillars of computer science. And this is what we study in computer science. And if we were to think about, well, schools have often core subjects. Well, what would be the core subject of computer science? And it breaks down to the two main ideas, algorithms and data structures. Algorithm is a set of proven instructions that solve a given problem that are classified by their speed and memory efficiency. Whereas data structure is the study of designing storage option depending on the data used in a given problem where the concepts of searching, storing, sorting, deleting are concerned. So basically where you want to have bunch of bunch of data stored somewhere and we want to write algorithms for searching, storing, sorting, and deleting from that data structure. But for us to have a data structure, we must be able to code it. So we must study different data structures. Once you've got a degree in computer science, you can get into many of these fields. Like you can become a programmer, developer, a coder, where you're acting um, to write a computer program. You can become a software engineer. You are in charge of creating digital code solutions to a given worldly problem. You can also become a computer engineer where you mix the skills of electronic circuits and you also code so that you solve other types of problems. You can also get into system design where you're in charge of structuring a digital solution for a given problem. And you kind of think about um, the holistic nature of that. Uh, you can get into machine learning and artificial intelligence, something that is extremely hot and popular at the moment where you're designing machines that can learn and improve to solve a given problem. Okay, so it's really problem solving dependent. And as a computer scientist, that is something that you want to be good at. It's because you'll be often solving various problems. You can also get into cryptography. It's a study of revealing hidden information or hiding sensitive information, which is always uh, nice because it leads right into a really nice field of technology called cybersecurity and infosec, which is the study of protecting various levels of hardware and software around the world. So if that is computer science, one thing we must know is, well, what can a computer do, right? Because we want to know the science behind what a computer can do. So when we generalize our interactions with the computer, we have something called an operating system and applications that are stored in that computer as well. And they interact together so that we can have stuff like this, where you're watching a video on YouTube, all the way to you creating a program, playing video games, or creating a Word document, and so on. An application that is running will have its current behavior stored in the memory. So the whatever instruction set that it has, it will actually go to a uh, hardware inside your computer called RAM. And then an application will create instructions to the CPU. So it will be like, hey, I'm an application. I need these set of instructions to be completed. And the CPU will handle those instructions. And then the CPU will process the information, carry out the instructions that you have set and will update the application status. Most often we see an output back on the monitor. All right. So CPU is the king of the computer. It handles the instructions given by applications and operating system and by you. So a CPU, which stands for a central processing unit, can understand the following operations and more with binary numbers. Most often it will read instructions in linear order, right? And it can do instructions like arithmetic, logical operations, shifting bits left and right, or rotating bits left and right. It can jump to different instructions that are stored in memory if needed. And it can also look at comparison operations to see if two values are equals or not. Now, this is a very, very generic overview of how a CPU receives instructions and what a CPU can do to follow the instructions designed by an application. 
good. So if we wanted to go very, very, very low level, this example here is a, um, a low level. It is an assembly language that is giving instruction to the CPU. and It is very gross. Um, this is very hard to read. And so this is all this is required for us to increment a counter variable, a variable that is just supposed to go from zero to 10. Right, it's systematically and it requires all this bunch of mumble jumbo. And this is why we created the concepts of higher level programming languages. Okay. But before we get there, let's talk about abstraction. Abstraction, the terminology itself is called, it's about complex behaviors, stuff that is very complex that are generalized to simpler terms, something that we can actually uh, digest and work with, with the promise that even though we generalized it and, and put it into simpler terms, we still get to do the complex behaviors that we wanted, right? Because they, there's a promise and trust that this abstracted new term will behave the same way as the non-abstracted term, okay? So this is where we talk about machine level code and assembly and high level code. So working at the level of CPU, we call that a machine level code because the CPU is dealing with zeros and ones. Okay. So if you work at that level, you must have a very intricate understanding of circuits and binary numbers because you must give on and off instruction set to the CPU. Right. But this makes it very difficult because if you know, binary numbers only have two possible options, zeros and one, and binary numbers can often get lengthy depending on the number of um, information you need to give, as in number of bits you need to provide to do certain operations. Therefore, programmers and developers and technicians and computer scientists have developed this concept called programming languages, especially high level languages, which are considered abstractions of low level or machine level code. Because we wanted to avoid writing zeros and ones, we wanted to write a human readable language that is similar to the word uh, words and syntax of English, so that we can instruct our computers much easier. So the act of abstraction and practice of it will be a separate lesson in the future. But just know that when we took machine level code and created high level code, it can be an example of abstractions happening in real world. So let's look at some common programming languages. We have Python with use for data science, automations, and artificial intelligence. JavaScript, it is the king of web and mobile development. Java, you create desktop applications, Android applications, and you can do data science as well. For C, you often create operating system, embedded systems, and game development. And you can see here right away, like we're creating systems often with C and embedded systems. It is because it is a lower level language compared to the most of the language you see here. So we often create more um, delicate things with the language of C. Uh, for C Sharp, it, it's a very window centric language. We create window applications or do game development. C++, often we just use it for game development. We have Swift, where you can create iOS or Mac OS applications. This is a Mac specific uh, language. And we have SQL, it's a structural structured query language. That's what it stands for. And it's a data ma database management language, which is something that we're going to talk, uh, talk about this year. So a myth that I want to talk about, you only need to know this blank programming language because it is the best. There is no such thing as the best programming language. Um, there are preferred languages for different scenarios, but most often if you see apps like big, big apps that we interact every day with stuff like Instagram, um, YouTube, and so on. They're all a system. They are a combinations of multiple different programs working together in written in different languages as well, all working in unison so that we can get the services they provide. So there are some common basic features of a programming language to start off their syntax, the rules to combine words to create executable code. So these are set rules. There's semantics. We must understand that the language provides this consistent behavior and we must use it properly to have our code do proper things. Cause sometimes you could just write full gibberish, um, horrible combinations of English words that don't make sense 
because you spelled them all right, that does not mean that it made a proper coherent sentence. In the same way, even though you can memorize all the um, proper spellings of Python functions, but if you don't use them properly, you will get your semantics wrong. Um, there are keywords. Keywords are words that you can't really use as variable names or custom things that you want to do inside a, um, in that language because they're reserved to be like executable code that does certain tasks. Um, with programming languages, you can declare variables. Basically, you have a labeled storage and memory where you get to store relevant data. And you have different types of data that can be supported by the programming language, right? Um, so most often the common data types that we can have are um, integers, uh, floating point numbers, which represent decimal and real numbers, characters, string, and complex types like arrays and objects. Um, programming languages will have options to do arithmetic like plus, minus, multiply, divide, floor, divide, find the remainders of a division, and so on. It gives you the ability to compare values and uh, execute logic so that we can make decisions in our program. Uh, let's see where we go. Oh, and we can also make conditional trees so that we can once again make decisions based on something being true or logically being something true or false. We can create loops. We can repeat certain blocks of code so that we don't need to write repetitive code over and over again. And we can also do branches. We can travel to different parts of the written code so that we can um, kind of design our code that way where it, um, different problems will have different coded solutions so we travel to different areas where those um, solutions are coded and when we talk about programming languages we must also talk about interpreter versus compiler so uh, when we talk about interpreted python is an interpreted language whereas java is a compiled language so python is an interpreted language it's code much like how you would follow an instruction set when you build ikea furniture or when you build a lego set or when you cook a cookie or when you bake a cookie you start from the top you execute the instructions line by line one by one and then hopefully you have a delicious cookie and that's how python um, behaves as well we start at the very top of the instruction set on line zero or one and we go down by down by nine until either we can't execute that line of code because there's an error or we get to the end of the file whereas java what it does is translates the entire code into something our CPU can understand, and then it tries to execute the code within that file line by line. And that's when, that's how we consider Java a compiled language, even though it goes top to bottom, it translated it all into machine language first, then execute the code. Whereas Python will translate one line and then execute and another line then execute until the very end. So some pros and cons, interpreted languages are faster to make code for, but they are often slower in execution. And then compile languages are often much faster in executions because the entire code base is already translated to machine level code and machine level code is always, always faster because there is no layers of abstractions for us to have any translations. But compile languages require a full code translation to machine slash bytecode. So how does Python work? Well, Python is written by the programmer and the programmer will run that code. The Python interpreter that comes with the computer when you install Python will translate one line at a time. And that single line of Python code is translated to bytecode and the uh, Python virtual machine will translate that bytecode so that our CPU can understand what to do in terms of low level machine level code. It will execute that and then go to the next line We'll go st to step three in this case and translate another line to bytecode and it will repeat that process over and over and over again. So for us to become a programmer, there are three fundamental topics that you should know. First is variables. Variables are changeable containers where they are, the, the values can change, where they often have a name, a label to say that this variable holds x data and type what type of things can we put inside the variable i like to think of variable as boxes that has names on them so if you have a box and it says clothes you should 
be putting clothes on them because the box uh, is expecting only clothes to be stored in that box, right? And also, if you um, are not interested in that clothes anymore, it's old and you want to throw it away and replace it with a new one, that helps too because variables can change. So our box of containers can change. Whereas constants are similar to variables, they will have often a data type associated to it so that we only restrict certain values of data to be stored. Or um, they can have also, just like a variable, a name, but often constants don't change at all and they just stay at one value from the very start when it was declared. All right, then we have this concept of objects. Objects are data types that don't exist and you need a special data type when you make a program. So often when you create an object in programming, it bundles the two fundamental concepts of having data and behavior. All right, so data means objects has information attached to it and behavior means this object has functionality, it can do things. So for example, if you created a digital dog object, um, you can code it, you can code it so that you can provide that digital dog having a name, age, and breed. And also that digital dog, you can program ways so that it has uh, actionable items such as like eating, sleeping, drinking, and going potty. Now, when a dog has literal data provided, as in the name's Marshall, the age is four, and his breed is Westie, then this Marshall four-year-old Westie, which is a dog object, has the features and the ability to eat, sleep, and drink, and potty, which were all coded within your program. Concepts of objects are so important that there's an entire programming method called object-oriented programming, and we'll be diving into that in our future videos. Let's talk about collections, which is another important concept to learn because we often work with multiple, multiple data items. And when we store multiple data items in some sort of a storage, we call those uh, a, a general umbrella term to be called a collection. Collection is a general term describing data structures in programming languages that can store multiple data. And there are some examples like arrays. Arrays are sequential containers, so they um, receive values in order one by one. And if you wanted to access them, uh, you just go to where that data item is, is located in terms of its in integer base index, and you can grab that data. You can also, um, from an array, you can tweak that a little bit and create a queue. When we line up to go get food or buy that new Nike shoes, you often line up in a queue and it's a first come first serve. So to um, have that kind of behavior, um, coded in a program, we often use a queue, or you might even design a queue yourself. Um, when you don't need to worry about duplicate values, but you need the searching, like you need to know where that value is located really fast, we can use a concept like a set. And if there are a lot of relationships between um, values and we, you need to link them somehow, we can create a tree, a structure where each data item has a slot for its own data of what it is and links to its neighbor. And when these links are formed, it kind of shows like a tree structure. So those are possible terms that you may see and we will do a deeper dive into them in the future. And lastly, as a programmer, you'll often even create sub-programs. Sub-programs are a generalization of terms such as function, methods, subroutines, and procedures, which you'll see in your programming journey. Sub-programs are a set of instructions that are callable within the program itself, and these sub-programs are designed to perform specific tasks to aid the program. So for example, like if we had an entire program that was a laundromat, a laundromat, you know, you have the service of like, oh, you pay money, you put coins in and all that. But within a laundromat, we can have potential two sub programs. There could be a washer, which you put um, dirty laundry in, put some uh, laundry detergent, and it will wet the clothes and wash the clothes for you. Whereas another sub uh, program called the dryer it is expected to take wet clothes and dry your clothes um, so that you don't have to wear wet clothes. Okay, so in a laundromat, which is a bigger prop program, has little sub programs that do certain tasks, and a laundromat, the big program, will use the little programs as needed, much like how big programs have are consist of multiple little programs to help us in our daily lives.
So that was that. That is how a programming language is formed, and that is what we study in computer science. We uh, really worry about computation, information, and automation, and we really worry about algorithms and data structures, and those are all concepts that we're going to be introduced in this course, and so on. And as always, thank you for watching, and stay classy.